thank you guys for coming today or joining us today. Um, my name is Andrea Fain. Um, in the SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism, my name's Mistress Disa E. Um, I, uh, I, and this is the class's posament, an overview of my trip to the Historic Musée. So we'll be doing, uh, basically we'll be going over a lot of the, um, <laughs> we'll be going over a lot of the information that I, that I learned when I went to Stockholm and saw the posement in person. And then we'll have a discussion at the end about preparing for your own trip um, to museums and, and, and researching through, through those kind of venues. So as I said, uh, my name is Disa Iberkelundi. Uh, I've been researching posement for about six years, maybe, maybe closer to seven now. Um, and I've been researching the creation of tin thread, which is the, um, the cording that they use to make, um, the cording that they use to make the posament um, for about five years. I traveled to Stockholm, uh, well, actually last year now. <laughs> I traveled to Stockholm last year in April to see the extant posament pieces um, in the archives at the Historica Museet, which was an incredible experience. Um, this is actually a picture of me at the museum with all the posema pieces here. These drawers are full of it. It's, it was pretty incredible. So big question, what is posament? Uh, posament is wire, uh, generally silver wire, but wire that's coiled around a fiber core, um, generally silk. So it's kind of, it looks kind of like a guitar string almost, just a little more flexible. Uh, it's used to generally adorn fabric, and it's found almost exclusively in Birka, Sweden in the 9th and 10th centuries. All right, who wore posement? So it's found almost always in graves of men. Uh, however, with the recent recategorization of, of graves and, um, and the kind of further analysis of like the kind of the, you know, the woman warrior uh, grave, um, all of the types that uh, have been found have been found in both men's and women's graves, which is really exciting because before it was very little posament that was found in women's graves. And I mean, I, I really like the stuff. I you know, I, I kind of want to put it on my clothing. So um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it's generally seen in kind of the head area and the belt area uh, found on scabbards and um, purses, bags. Uh, and it's probably used because it's found in kind of the head area. Uh, it's uh, probably used on headpieces and um, uh, scarves and, and hats, that kind of thing. So, uh, where is it found? This picture, by the way, so this is a picture that I took when I went to Birka, when I was in Stockholm. And um, this picture is actually of the graves. Uh, if you can see uh, the area in the bottom corner that's kind of um, dug out, that is, that's an excavated grave. And, and these are graves. It was pretty incredible to be able to see that and think, there could be posement or all sorts of amazing things in these graves. Um, so of the uh, 1,103 graves that have been excavated on Berka, only 44 of them contain posement. So less than 4%. Um, so it's not, it's not a massive amount. It is really cool, Jeff, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it, there are four different types of graves on Berka, uh, chamber graves, coffin graves, non-coffin graves, and cremation graves. It's pretty self-explanatory, I think. 55% um, of the posement found um, is found in chamber graves. So, and those are only 10% of the total graves, which, I mean, we don't have a lot of information, right? There's, there's not a lot of posement that's been found, but, but that's pretty significant. You know, that, that's pretty significant that, that it's that, that large of a percentage. 
So chamber graves, which are where it's found mostly, um, they're most commonly used in the 10th century. Um, you know, there's all, all sorts of kind of thoughts on that, but primarily they're, they're the 10th century. Um, they showed high status within the community, but not necessarily wealth. Um, so it was most likely worn by higher status individuals in the 10th century um, and in smaller quantities within the rest of the community. One of the things that I did find is that they, um, that the posament is found in groups, you know, groups of graves. So, you know, several graves that are close to each other will have, will have posament in it, which to me makes me feel like it's, you know, it's something that was around for kind of a short period of time if that makes sense. Um, I, I like to say it's kind of like the pogs of the, uh, you know, of Birka, right? It's this thing that was around for a really short period of time that people really liked and thought was cool, and then it, it kind of faded away. So different types of posament. Um, there, are, there are eight types, which is great. There's, it's, it's not a massive amount of kind of different kinds. If you, if you learn how to make these four braids and these four knots, you can do pretty much any of the posament that, uh, that's been found. Um, so there's, yeah, four braids and four knots. Um, all of the other styles are created using those types of knots. The materials that are used, uh, silver, silver wire um, and gold wire. Uh, initially, I thought that it was pretty much only silver wire for uh, for the tin thread for the um, for the kind of coiled type of posament um, I, I hadn't really seen any that I thought was yeah there there is a handout available there's a handout available I'll, I'll send it to you um, the um, I, I thought that there was no gold tin thread that had been found but when I went there, the first thing that stood out to me was, um, was the fact that, you know, she opened the drawer and there were these two little square ones at the bottom of the uh, screen here that are gold. In the pictures that you see online, it's uh, just the way the, the coloring is and stuff, it's really hard to take pictures in there. And they looked silver. In my mind, at least, they'd always looked silver. So I was really, really excited to see gold wire. Um, the core of Posament is silk thread. I've tried a lot of different materials. I've tried linen, I've tried wool, I've tried hemp, I've tried cotton. Um, and really the only thing that works well when you're creating tin thread is silk because it's strong and it's smooth. So, you know, you're not going to have a lot of breakage and when, because once your thread's broken, it's really hard to continue making your tin thread. Um, so, and it's, it's, you know, the smoothness of it makes it so that you can actually um, coil the wire up and, and push it down on the thread so that it's a tight coil. Um, and uh, so, yeah, nothing else really works well like that. So size of wire and tin thread, um, they vary. They, they vary greatly. Um, so wire size between 28 to 36 gauge i before i went there i wouldn't have said 36 gauge but definitely that small um and then for the wire for the gold uh it's 24 to 36 um it's a little bit thicker because a lot of the 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 pieces that are just braided flat wire because there's the two types there's the coiled uh, tin thread posament, and then there's the 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 kind of drawn wire that's just kind of uh, put into shapes like like the um, golden deer that kind of thing. Um, those ones are going to be a heavier wire. Uh, the tin thread itself, once it's coiled, it measures from between 0.25 millimeters to about a millimeter. It's really 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 small and it's it's hard to it's hard to truly even in pictures understand how absolutely tiny it is it's pretty incredible so creating the tin thread itself this was something that i just kind of 
really wanted to know. It's this incredibly tiny little coiled wire. You know, what on earth were they doing that with? And I had um, I'd tried several different things um, in the Berka book they suggested that it was created on a needle so I tried that um, but the smallest I could make was was about a millimeter it wasn't uh, it wasn't it wasn't nearly small enough um, but I had a friend who I asked to look for um, because I knew that the Sammy still make tin thread they still use tin thread in their jewelry and so I asked her if she could look in Swedish because I don't speak Swedish um, for information on how the Sammy make their tin thread. And she sent me a message in the middle of the night and she said, I found it. And, and it was this crafting book. And this, in this crafting book, this lovely lady is using a drop spindle to make tin thread. And it made so much sense because a drop spindle is something they're gonna have, right? So we're not gonna find different tools for, you know, for this really tiny specific thing. We're gonna find, you know, we're gonna find something they already used. And something they use so much that it would just make sense. Um, the picture down at the bottom of the screen is uh, it's from the Sami exhibit at the Nordeska, um, the the Nordic Heritage Museum in Stockholm, and it was in the Sami exhibit. And you can see here this is tin thread that's been created, and then in the back here is is a draw plate for drawing the wire down. So this picture here of me is actually the first time that I really started to try it. And it was at, it was at an event, it was at Arts Unframed. And I said, okay, well, let's give it a try. And immediately I started being able to, to do it and I can put it down, I can pick it back up. It just makes so much more sense. It's very, it's easier to do than, than trying to use a wire. Uh, a needle because with a needle you've got to coil it onto the needle and then you got to push it off onto the silk and it's it's a lot more clunky it's it's you can't really just easily put it down so okay so visiting the museum um this was an incredible experience this is this is the back the 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 building in the picture is the um kind of back entrance of the historica and it was it was an incredible experience. Um, everyone there was just so wonderful and um, it was, it was lovely. But these pictures uh, here, so this is uh, the one of me obviously is, um, you know, taking the pictures. I've got kind of my supplies that I brought. I brought a notebook with some questions and things and a pen and um, which partially I brought so that I could kind of uh, show pictures to scale. Um, and then just all these incredibly tiny little posament bits here. Um, and then the picture over on the other side. So the second day, uh, she actually offered to, um, to have us come back the second day um, because uh, my partner, Alistair, he, uh, he does woodworking and they were talking about woodworking. And so she said, well, do you want to come back tomorrow and I can show you some woodworking? So this is actually the second day. Um, and we, we were able to come back and look at some really cool wood pieces, which was really neat. All right, so seeing the Poseman in person, first of all, it's way smaller than I really could have imagined. I think it's hard to, when you see pictures and, and you know, a lot of the problems with the, the original pictures are there's no scale to them at all. It's just a picture of the thing, right? Which makes it really hard to, um, to have any concept of how tiny it is. And I, I tried to do that with the little bits of ruler that were kind of in the pictures, but again, it's really hard to do. So, you know, looking at these pictures, you can see a little bit more like, you know, having the pen here, it gives you a better concept of how small that is. It's really incredible. The other thing I realized is the, um, the pictures are not great because they're really, really hard to f photograph. The lighting is not great. The these, you know, a lot of these have been sealed for, you know, over 50 years. So they're dirty. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not a clean, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a clear piece of glass, right? Um, the really cool thing is some of them are, some of them, the glass has come off. So like the one in the corner here is more clear because there's no glass there, but you can see in, um, 
in the one that's BJ400B and BJ496, those are, you know, they have glass in them and that's why it's so hard to take pictures. So um, the exciting thing is um, that there is, it, it is in the works to repackage these. Um, so hopefully, hopefully soon um, there will be new photographs and uh, there'll be new photographs and there will be, um, and they'll be in new cases. So, you know, so they'll be able to kind of look at them a little bit more in detail. It is very crazy. I know, uh, Jeff said you can extra extrapolate how tiny they are, though, and it's crazy. It really is crazy. And I was glad that I brought the pen because everybody kind of has a good idea, right, of how big a pen is. Because even having a measurement isn't, isn't as helpful. But having something that you know the size of gives you a better idea. So other exciting stuff, and I talked about this a little bit, was um, gold tin thread. I had no idea that there was gold tin thread, and I was so excited. I, yes, I will. Um, somebody asked if I could speak about the magnifying tool for the phone. Yes, I, I absolutely will do that at the end. Um, so the, um, the, the fact that there was gold tin thread was really exciting, and I, I'm actually really excited to create some of that so I can make some of these little really cool um, gold bits. Um, the other thing here is, this piece and we we all kind of looked at it the three of us looked at it really closely and trying to kind of figure it out you can see that the posament has rolled a little bit here uh, at the bottom and so it was harder to see but this was the close-up picture i was able to get of it and and if and if we oops there we go if we look at the end um you know as you looked at the end in the box it, it's most likely a sheath um so that's kind of cool to, to know that, okay, this is a thing that it was attached to and it's most likely a sheath. So this was another thing that I was incredibly excited about. This piece of posament was the kind of piece that I'd seen one picture of and fallen in love with. And it was the thing that made me kind of go crazy for this little tiny wire thing. Um, but I could only find one picture and it, it was, it was the same picture, you know, everywhere. There was nothing else. And, and, um, the Historica has an incredible database where you can go through and see pictures of so many of the extant pieces that are there. Um, this was nowhere to be found in the grave that it was labeled as and, um, in, in the Birka books, Birka three. And, um, I think it was labeled as like 1025 or something like that. And when I went there, I asked about it. It's the first thing I asked about. And she said, oh no, it's right here. And she pulled it out and there was the piece that I'd seen one picture of that I'd loved. It was so exciting. Um, it was not labeled as the right grave. And that's why I couldn't find it. <laughs> so I took a lot of pictures. I took a lot of pictures of that one. And it's, it was really, really exciting to see that that actually existed and it was still around. And, um, and it, was a, it was a really incredible moment. Okay. So as far as, um, as far as your own trip. Okay. Hang on. Let me, I need to just pull something up for myself here really quick. There it is. Okay. All right. So as far as your own trip, um, big things that I learned. Um, first of all, don't be afraid to contact museums. Even before you're going to another country, you've, you know, you're going to a museum, don't be afraid to send a message to, you know, a curator at a museum, to, you know, their kind of those the contact emails because these are people that you know love this stuff too and they they will respond i've been you know i've been in conversations with people at the historica and other museums for probably a decade on, on different things on you know antler combs and uh and wire weaving and and posement um and they're so helpful they're so kind don't be afraid to send a message. And if you don't hear from the person that you message, maybe find another 
email address or, you know, or send another message. They're busy people, their job, they may have missed your email. So don't be afraid to contact them. Um, when you go to another country in the hope of seeing some cool thing, make sure to set up an appointment ahead of time. <laughs> if, if you don't set up an appointment ahead of time, you may not get to see it. When we, uh, when we were there, uh, about three months before we were there, they actually closed down to refurbish the Viking exhibit at the Historica. So there was actually no Viking exhibit there. But I had set up an appointment probably six months or so before to make sure that I was able to go in the back and we were able to go in the back and actually see this stuff. So that's so important. Make sure if you're planning, you know, try to plan six months ahead. Um, another thing is if, you know, if there's something, yeah, contact them several months ahead and then, and then double check the days and times that the museums are open uh, and make sure the exhibits are available. In Sweden, a lot of the museums are closed on Mondays. So if, you know, if you're there and you have a short period of time, maybe make sure that you're not going to be there on a Monday, right? Okay, let's see. Uh, bring a list of things that you want to see and questions that you want to ask, okay? You're going to need that. When you get there and you, you know, she, she opened this drawer, you can see this drawer right here, and there are, I think, three more of them um, that was just full of posement. You know, all the posement that exists was right there, and it was very overwhelming. Um, luckily, I'd written down just some grave numbers <laughs> and some, some questions that I had to ask. So, you know, you, and, and in the handout, it says, you may feel like you're well prepared and know what you want to see, uh, but when face to face with something you've been researching or a museum full of amazing artifacts, you may go blank. Uh, make a list of questions you want to ask and, p and pieces that you want to see. Mark them off as you go and write down some notes about the answers given to your questions because a lot of it's not going to stick. Um, you know, it's, it's just so much happening. Uh, let's see. I, I was going to say another thing. Oh, I actually, one of the things I wanted to see was the golden deer posament piece. Um, and I forgot, <laughs> I forgot to have uh, her pull that one out. I didn't actually take any pictures of it and I didn't realize it until I got home, um, you know, like two weeks later. So let's see. Uh, again, they are excited about this stuff as you are. We had wonderful conversations. Um, everybody that we talked to was really lovely. And, um, and, you know, just remember these, yes, these are people that work at the museums and they handle this stuff. But they're also excited about it. They also think it's cool and they also want to learn. And, um, you know, when I was told that, you know, reenactors are, are a great resource because we touch things and we, you know, we do things, you know, we, we wear the clothing and we make the stuff and, and that's very helpful for them. So having a conversation can enlighten both of you, which is, which is a great thing and kind of part of the, the point, right? Um, bring multiple cameras. So I had my very nice camera and it took terrible pictures in that lighting and everything else. It took terrible pictures. My phone camera worked way better, way, way better. Um, so make sure that you have emptied out the memory of your phone and of your camera. Make sure that you have extra batteries. Make sure your phone is fully charged and that you have maybe a, a battery pack with you to charge it more. Um, because you never know what's going to work best. So the, uh, the thing that somebody actually asked about earlier um, was the magnifying tool. So um, the, uh, the lovely woman that I was, uh, that, that I met with um, at the Historica, um, she, she actually said, oh, let me, you know, let me show you this. And, and she, she had a little camera magnifier for her phone and you just clip it onto where the camera is and it magnifies what you're taking pictures of and and she let me use it and i was able to take much closer pictures and 
and it, it worked so much better. And I went out and bought a kit right there. There's a link in the handout um, that to to uh, you know example of of one of them. But you can find them all over the place. Now that I know that they exist, you know now I now I see them. But oh man, that was that was the nicest thing to have, and it was nice to have in you know in just kind of the standard museum settings too, not just when you were really up close. There was like a macro and a, and a micro and a, a fisheye, I think, were the, uh, were the different lenses that, that the kit that I had had. Um, bring a notebook. Notebooks are important. Um, you know, you can, that way you can write down uh, answers to your questions. Uh, you can write down other questions that you might have or things that you want to look up when you get home. Um, it's, it's pretty handy to have, you know, just you 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 know when you're traveling you want to pack light but that's an important thing to have i just had a little tiny notebook you can see it here um i actually didn't bring a notebook and i picked this up at um drotting home castle uh, palace the the day before so i'm i'm pretty glad i did that <laughs> um and then the other thing that i that i would say is if you're there and you're looking at this stuff that you've you know been so passionate about you're going to get overwhelmed uh um my my partner actually said that i i didn't really talk for several minutes <laughs> and he finally said are you okay because i was it was just so overwhelming it was just so incredible to see all these pieces that i you know that i'd been you know scrutinizing pictures of for so long um so the uh the, the last thing that i have and and the the last thing that that you'll be able to access um it'll be in the handout and i also have a blog at um www.earlysweden.wordpress.com um and the handout um and these links are actually also available at that blog so um there are links to my uh, to the archives of the pictures that i took while i was over there so all of the Posement pictures that I took are are available um, on that archive, and they're broken down by grave, so you can see kind of how they were grouped together. Um, and then I have another uh, link to the silver brocade that I took pictures of, um, also uh, in the archive. Um, I, I had a friend ask me to take pictures of those, and so I took pictures of those, and those are available too. And then the last link is actually for all of the museum pictures that I took uh, in Stockholm and on Gotland. So that's lots of pictures. I'm not saying they're amazing pictures. They're not perfect. I'm not a photographer, but it's more information, right? It's, it's more angles. It's more pictures to see. So, um, and, and it would, will give you an idea too of kind of what those museums look like and how they're laid out. So um, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to type those in the chat anybody oh yes so i'll type out the um the address for the blog so it's www.early that's e a r l y sweden dot wordpress w o r d p r e s s dot com and early sweden is one word and wordpress is one word so www dot early sweden dot wordpress dot com and that's in the chat there i am doing a class on how to make posament in a couple of weeks um but if you want to uh if you want to get started on making it um if you want to get started on making it uh my blog also has uh links to my videos so i i have actual instructional videos on how to do all the knots all the pose mode knots but i will be doing in a couple of weeks i'll be doing another uh, another pose mode class and it'll be a a how-to class this one is is more you know it's kind of the first class and i wanted to make sure that everything worked before we did something that was a little more hands-on because that's going to be a little bit trickier we are looking at wire weaving too yeah um so 
uh, Matthew asked, what would be my advice for visiting a historic site? Um, I would say, uh, well, the big, make sure that, you know, make sure that you know the hours, make sure that you know how much it's going to cost and if you're going to need to do that in, in cash or card. Uh, in Sweden, everything's pretty much on card, which was nice. I didn't have to do any cash. Um, other things, don't wear new shoes, wear comfortable shoes, and um, don't, don't dress too heavily. You know, make sure that you're, you're going to be comfortable in the, uh, in the museum itself, right? Um, and, and don't be afraid to kind of explore other areas of the museum that aren't necessarily the stuff that you're interested in, because you can very easily find stuff that is absolutely related to what you're interested in. Um, the, let's see, other questions here. Where do you buy your materials, online or in person? So I buy them online. Um, there are a couple of people on Etsy that sell 10 thread. Um, the, uh, the happy frog, I want to say, is one of them. Um, but there are also links to where to buy the 10 thread. Um, on on my blog um and then in the class in the future i'll also have the um i'll have the links there too let's see what sort of materials were the posament in this collection mounted on um the covering of the knife sheath leather i think so the okay so the let's go with the sheath first so i think that the so the sheath itself it was wood and then it's covered in something i think it's leather i think it's leather um i was honestly much more focused on the posman that was attached to it um so what sort of materials were the posman uh mounted on it's a fabric they're 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 mounted on a fabric um I don't know exactly what fabric it is, but but it is a fabric, and then it's a little cardboard box with uh, with glass over the top. Uh, let's see. Uh, the posament knots I've seen look very similar to macrame knots. I remember my mom making back in the seventies. Do you know how similar they are? They are the same. They're the same. Um, we use four different knots basically, and then four braids to make posament. And I mean, a knot's a knot, right? And a lot of them have lasted for a long time. So, so it is, it's the same thing. It's like micro macrame, basically. Um, did you use a filter for polarized light for the camera? I've had trouble with glare in my museum photos and been given that suggestion. I'm not a real big camera person. Like I, I, I didn't, I didn't bring anything with me besides the cameras and um, the camera and the phone. Um, the problem is the lighting is really, is really odd. I didn't have as much glare. Um, the glare wasn't the issue. It's just really that the glass is, the glass is dirty. And so you, you can't get a really clear picture of a lot of it. Let's see. Uh, yeah, micro macrame. I know I like that. Uh, I like that um, that term. Um, but it's something that's done. Like micro macrame is a thing. Um, uh, so somebody asked. So then that would. Uh, th so then would posament hold similar status to tartan later in period? I don't know. Uh, first of all, I don't know a lot about tartan. Second of all, um, we just don't have enough of it right there's not enough of it and there's not a lot enough um and uh, not a, enough information to really to really know you know it could have been just one person that found a thing that the sammy did um that they really liked and copied it um and then gave it to their friends we we don't really know um you know it's it's hard to fully determine you know who was in the different types of graves. So if we don't really fully know that, then it's hard to know. Let's see. So um, people are talking about uh, 
about how similar they are to to nautical knots. Yeah, that's that's the cool thing about knots. Um, when I was trying to figure out the the different knots that were used, I didn't need to to have you know just books about posement because there aren't books about posement. Um, what I had was books about knots, right? Because it's the same stuff. If you look, it's it's the exact same stuff. And there are a lot of different ways to do knots. And the videos that I've done are how I um, are how I I found I, that worked best for me. But I know other people do things differently. Uh, let's see. The longest piece that I saw. That's a good question. The longest piece that I saw, hmm, I would say 18 inches maybe. Yeah, so maybe a little bit, so maybe less than that, but I would say less than 18 inches, but also some of it is broken apart, you know, so it's, it's, it could have been longer. Um, I have, uh, somebody asked if I'm thinking about writing a book. So I have not, uh, I mean, I, I kind of, I have all of my documentation, all the things I've written, I've put online because I want it to be easily accessible. I, I could put that in a book form, I guess. Um, but for me, the most important thing is getting the information out there um, and, and letting people see it. Uh, <laughs> Sheila says, write the book. Um, <laughs> I might, we'll, we'll see, right? We're going to be in our houses here for a while, right? So maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. Let me see. Are there other questions here? Yeah. So then it's still a question of how was it actually made? We just have the result. We, we do. We only have the result. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, I've, I've done, I've done a lot of, uh, of experimenting and trying different things and um, and the posament being made on a drop spindle it makes the most sense i'll try and do a video and post it on my youtube channel um, so that you can see that it's it's hard to get kind of a detailed picture because it's so tiny but i'll i'll try and come up with a way to do that so that it's it's more easily seen i think i actually have an idea Somebody says that's why we're recreationists. Exactly. I mean, we, you know, we work on this stuff and and we 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 have it in our hands. And so it, it, it makes a lot of sense to us because we, you know, that's what we do. Uh, are there any other questions? Oh, was it more concentrated in specific groups? It was it was on Birka. That was it. Um, Matthew, do you mean uh, specific groups on Birka or or elsewhere? Because it, it basically it's in that period of time, using the using the materials that are used, the the silver and gold and the silk, um, it's it's pretty much just on Birka. There are a couple of other pieces that have kind of recently been found, but but that's it. Belt pouches. What would those have been made of? That's a good question. Um, now I'm thinking about the pieces that I saw. I believe they were, I believe they were leather. But you do see, as far as the posament, um, you see posament attached to silk, um, and and you and you see it kind of on the edge of things. Um, but again, it's it's such a small, you know, small bits, and and a lot of times the the fibers have disappeared, so it's hard to really, uh, it's hard to really know everything that they were using. Um, social groups, again, it's it's they are found in. Um, when I went through all the graves, they were kind of found clumped together. So you know, so there would be a whole, you know, a whole bunch of graves in one area that have posement on them, and then, and then there'd be another. And that could be that it's one family. That could be, you know, that it's it's kind of one one social group. Um, but I, but I don't know specifically what social group that would be. 
or if, or if it's a family or if it's just a time frame, you know, there are a lot of things that, that, um, that it's kind of hard to, to know. Sorry, I can't uh, be more help there. I wish I had that information. I wish I could have seen down into those graves, right? When I was on Berka, it would have been incredible. <laughs> Anybody have anything else? Does anywhere else have anything similar? Yes. So um, later, I think it's later period, it could, it might not be. No, I guess they do have it kind of around that time too, but um, there is, there, there is other material that is, a, that is a, a metal that's kind of coiled around, um, that is coiled around a fiber, but it's a flat wire. It's not, this is, um, the, the difference between it is the tin thread is actually drawn. So it's a round wire and the, uh, the other wire is flat. Uh, let's see. Other questions. So you spoke on the piece that you fell in love with, but can you describe what led you to that and this interest? Um, I, you know, that's a really good question. I had seen a very long time ago, um, just a mention on a website uh, that sometimes they decorated their clothing with metal. And I thought that's kind of odd. I don't, you know, I don't really know. Um, I don't really know uh, how they would do that. That doesn't make any sense. And so I'd, I'd looked into it and I'd looked into it and, and there just wasn't any information. I couldn't find any information. And the actually, actually the big thing that, that got me into it was, um, uh, Drifa, who lives in Ontier, she did um, an arts and sciences entry, and it had a piece of Posman on it, and it was the first piece of Posman that I'd ever seen, and she gave me the name, uh, you know, because I couldn't find it even, I couldn't even find the name, because the, the article that I found just said they decorated with metal, and so once I had that, once I saw that, um, then I was able to actually start researching, and and then I just started going through each individual um, grave because there's this amazing database through Historica that, um, that there's a link to on my, on my blog also that you can go through each individual grave in Birka and you can see the pictures of all the pieces that, that, are, that are online, which is so cool. And so I was able to also see kind of what the most common things were found in graves, um, you know, kind of getting an idea of, of all sorts of stuff. And it was really exciting. Um, so I, I kind of went through and I cataloged all that. And then I was able to get a copy of, of Birka 3 and, uh, and a friend helped me translate that. Um, that little, I don't know, it's like two paragraph long thing about, about posament in there. And, um, and then I just kind of took off with it. I don't know, it just, the interest, I guess, I always joke that, um, uh, you know, my, my, my father's a, a machinist. He, he works with metal. And so I've been around, around metal my whole life. So maybe that's what, what drew me to it. But because um, I, I also really enjoy wire weaving. That's another thing that, I, that I, I've researched and taught. So um, I don't know, maybe it's just a family <laughs> trait to be drawn to metal. Um, somebody says it reminds them of the Finnish Iron Age use of metal coils on their clothing. I agree. It's really interesting. Um, the Finnish stuff is really big. It's, you know, the coil, well, compared to this, the Finnish coils are really big. Um, and then they have a, like a braided cord in them or like a lucette done cord. Um, in them so it's 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 much larger but it, yeah i mean it's basically the only difference is they take kind of portions of metal coils and then they put them together with the cording um and um and for poseman it's one long piece that you then knot together like a like a piece of thread basically <laughs> somebody said maybe i have dwarven blood Maybe <laughs> it's possible. Um, are there any other questions that I've missed or, uh, or anything? Let's see. Are, 
I'm glad you enjoy it, Anya. Um, she says, I've been playing with sketches of braids and knots, and I can kind of find every one of them on my mom's bike stuff. This is cool. I'm glad that it's, I'm, I'm really glad that this is uh, interesting and, and that other people are excited. And it's, it's a really cool, you know, it's, I, I just love the kind of tiny things, you know, the little, the little, the, the crazy little bits, right, that, that people don't always look at. And I'm really glad that it has started, um, you know, that people have become more interested in it recently. It's very exciting. I, yeah, she said, I'd love to know how the relationship happened. It'd be, yeah, I, I know. Um, it wouldn't it be great if we could, could look back in time, right, and see what was really going on instead of just trying to guess it all. Those sort of diamond shaped posaments, did they have a material filling them? So the diamond shaped posaments are the same. They're, um, they look, oh, oh, okay. So yes, the, the diamond shaped ones, I'm actually gonna go back here. Oops, I'm gonna go back here so you can see what she means. So these down here, this is what you're talking about, I'm guessing. Um, so these ones have, uh, they have mica in them. So they, they have stone in them. Very thin stone, but yeah, it's, it's mica. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of mica. My goal is I want to put some of those together. I, I think those are so cool. Let's see, the smallest, what's the smallest piece I've ever made? Um, actual like posament piece um, because you can purchase tin thread and I, I purchased the 0.25 tin thread um, to to you know see how small I could do it and um, so the smallest piece I did some little uh, little squares um, like kind of like these ones like little squares and um, I think three of them fit on a penny which was really cool the the tin thread I've not been able to get down as small, but much smaller than um, much smaller than the um, the one millimeter that I was able to get down to using a needle. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. The the super super tiny little um, posement on the penny <laughs> was neat. Any other questions? Tin thread, yeah, I say tin thread. Um, uh, you know, I, there's when I did my first um, blog post about about posament and about tin thread. Um, my, you know, my goal is for it to be as accessible as um, as possible. So, and and I did get some people who, you know, who spoke Swedish, who you know, who were who live in Sweden that said, you shouldn't call it tin thread. Um, you should call it, you know, silver thread or, or whatever, basically the, the material is. The reason I use tin thread is because it's searchable. You can find it. You can, you can find the name. Um, and it's, it makes it difficult going back and forth between basically calling it silver thread and tin thread or gold thread or whatever. Um, it's, it's the same information. And I don't want to make it harder for people to find by using different terms, if that makes sense. So, okay. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> You're very welcome. I'm, I'm really happy that, um, that I had people, you know, join me and, and take the class and we're going to do on Sunday, we're going to do a, um, a tent painting class. Um, and then we have, the goal is to do a class. Um, yeah, yes, tent thread, T-E-N-T-R-A-D is what I'm referring to when I say tent thread. It's just, I, it's, it's a habit. Um, so the goal will be to have a class uh, on Wednesdays and on Sundays. Um, I have classes scheduled through Easter, and then we'll kind of go from there. And, and if anybody is interested, 
in, uh, in teaching, let me know. If anybody has an idea for a class, let me know and I'll see what I can do.